Seth here, as if you didn't know that. When thinking about what I was going to say, I asked myself, how many different ways are there to ask for money? Well, a quick Google search shows that there are 84,337, and that's just in the English language. Okay, that's an impressive tally, but it turns out that 99% of all pleas for support apparently go in one ear and out the other. Well, I don't believe that. Your ears are not connected by tubing running through your skull, unless you've been careless with sharp sticks. So I'm going to assume that Big Picture Science listeners will understand the importance of supporting the show and respond at a rate higher than 1%. It's simple. Just go to bigpicturescience.org and mouse-click the Support the Show button. bigpicturescience.org and take that stick out of your ear. Our world is sometimes puzzling. It's even more so when the government works to discredit the expertise of one of its own public health officials in the midst of a pandemic. Dr. Anthony Fauci, however, took the recent public undermining of his credibility in stride. You know, it it is a bit bizarre. I don't really fully understand it. You know, I think uh, if you talk to reasonable people in the White House, they realize that was a major mistake on their part because It doesn't do anything but reflect poorly on them. What's going on here? Sure, it's politics, but is it more than that? Expertise used to be valued in this country, and now it seems that being schooled in a subject can make you suspect. But we're in a global health crisis, and that seems precisely the time that you want to follow the science. However, from sidelining infectious disease scientists to burying COVID data, we seem to be doing the opposite. So if we're not following the experts and the data, then who and what are we following and why? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. In this episode, an investigative journalist and epidemiologist on doing science during a pandemic, why the current disregard for experts is more than the cherished ideal of questioning authority, plus how our notion of expertise went from racking up experience to racking up Twitter followers. It's our regular look at critical thinking, skeptic check, know-it-alls. Even before the pandemic unfolded, the current administration's relationship with science was chilly. They diminished the role of science and policy, they shut down peer-reviewed government studies, and often challenged findings related to the environment. Here's one that stuck with us, actually. It even disbanded a government committee that was working on a defense against invasive insects. Maybe the murder hornets got that memo. The disregard for scientific expertise seems pervasive, but at a time when our global health crisis demands it, Instead, we're hearing reports that President Trump is no longer talking to Anthony Fauci, or as one commentator put it, the pandemic is still around, Dr. Fauci is not. More than ignoring him, the White House is actively and publicly rebuking him. An op-ed written by a member of the administration railed against the competence of Dr. Fauci with such detail, it's hard to call it anything but a smear campaign. His colleagues in the public health field are reacting with dismay. Well, it is disheartening to see a hero like Tony Fauci be undermined. He's someone that I admired since I was a kid in San Francisco, which was hard hit early on by the HIV epidemic. I never imagined that I would ever see an attempt to discredit him from the very administration that should be working with him as a cohesive team. The question for us is not why the administration would discredit their own infectious disease expert. We leave that to the political analysts. But what do we lose when Washington turns away from science expertise in the face of a pandemic or when it limits the tools of science? For example, the Trump administration now requires hospital data to be sent directly to a private contractor, Palantir Technologies bypassing the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, our National Public Health Institute. Investigative reporter for the journal Science, Charles Piller, has been covering this issue, and Yale School of Medicine epidemiologist Allison Galvani's research is directly affected. 
Well, it's clear that President Trump does not want to make evidence-based decisions. This is an extraordinary moment because the outpouring of support for Fauci is near universal in public health and epidemiology communities. It reflects that there's a kind of uniformity of belief that taking scientific epidemiological issues and converting them for political purposes, uh, that that is not just counterproductive, but it's deeply harmful to how public health can be encouraged and enhanced in the pandemic. Allison, the president has dismissed the CDC's guidelines for reopening schools. You're an epidemiologist. You said that children should not return to school given the current state of the pandemic. So it sounds like your advice is about 180 degrees away from that of the administration. I, yeah, I agree with that <laughs> characterization. If anything, in my opinion, the CDC guidance doesn't go far enough. And if the Trump administration is declaring that uh, those recommendations to be too hard to be implemented in order to allow children to come back to school, then I think we have to conclude that we cannot safely have children go back to school. So the CDC has the experience and the expertise for analyzing outbreak data and for making those kinds of data-driven recommendations to stem transmission. I think um, probably another great example to bring up is the recent conversion of the data gathering process for COVID-19 from hospitals and states from CDC to a new platform at the Health and Human Services Department that is privately gathered, privately managed, privately analyzed data. This has been a uh, a very important change because it's thrown into disruption the key way in which epidemiologists, states, and others are able to gauge what's happening with the pandemic, not just in their localities, but also nationally. And what has happened in this conversion, which was imposed sort of in in an abrupt and seemingly arbitrary way, is that data is lost in the bargain. And there's been a number of key elements of that data that is no longer available to epidemiologists to analyze the state of the pandemic and the state of the needs of hospitals all over the country. So how do you feel about that, Allison, that this diversion of data and possibly making it less accessible or perhaps less complete, how does that affect the ability of scientists to fight this thing? It does uh, hamper our ability. Um, We rely on the publicly available CDC data to project the temporal trajectory of the outbreak and to suggest what are effective interventions for reducing transmission. So without that data, we're handicapped in being able to make evidence-based recommendations. But is that really true? Or is that just, you know, a kind of a reaction to to what they're doing? I mean, is it legitimately hampering research? It is. I mean, data-driven research, it, it is hampered by, by the CDC not being able to, as Charles mentioned, fill in the gaps and to analyze the data and, and go through it and present something that really makes sense. I think what this reflects, again, is this combination of a rejection of the bedrock principles of science as a a guide for how to manage the pandemic. And second, a privatization of the data process that most, I think, leading epidemiologists have regarded as not just counterproductive, but potentially disastrous going forward. Just to give you an example, more than 100 public health and medical organizations have written to the government pleading with them to reverse course to support the CDC as as the the entity that gathers and analyzes the data more fully. So, Allison, as a researcher, how do you work around this? Well, we've been looking at state-specific releases of data, and we are able, we think, to compile most of the data, but it's much more time-consuming than when we could look at a comprehensive data source that the CDC compiled. So so what you're saying is that uh, somebody's pulled on the uh, on the handbrake, but the car's still moving forward. Yes, the car's still moving forward, but at a much more uh, expensive manner. Again, I agree with what Allison's saying about this. And I wanted to add that epidemiologists with whom I've spoken have been seeking more granular data 
better data that can help them understand with great precision local outbreaks. And the reason for this is that resources need to be directed to the areas of greatest need. For example, uh, in New York, they were able to use very precisely targeted outreach in order to dramatically reduce cases and deaths from their peak in April. And the way they were able to do this was by knowing how that data interacts with the population, how it's produced, and to be able to go in, swoop in with services, testing, and even things like uh, offers of housing for people that have difficulty isolating in their households. So these are the kind of measures that better data, more data can help. And we just don't see that, not from the states, and really, honestly, not sufficiently from the CDC, even when they were doing this work. Charles, so what kind of data is no longer easily available that uh, formerly went to the CDC? Well, let me give you one example that was cited by a data scientist. In the CDC site, it was possible to tease out week by week comparisons of the entire country's COVID caseload by age group in a very easy to understand and clear way. Now, those data, because they're not presented in the same format and because some elements of them are missing, it's almost impossible to do that. Allison, I assume that uh, you would echo those sentiments? Absolutely. I think Charles gave a very uh, illuminating example. Our models, a lot of them are based on age-specific recommendations and taking into account age-specific contact patterns. And in order to make as accurate a projection as possible, we need that kind of stratification in the data. But it's clear that the degradation of the data, you just have to go up to the HH website, HHS website and see how the data has been treated now. And honestly, it's, it's shocking that much of the data that's up there now is almost nonsensical in its presentation. It, huge data gaps are, have been left compared to what CDC was doing, which was in itself, I should say, grossly inadequate for the kind of epidemiological research that researchers with whom I've spoken say they desperately need. All right, so this simple question, but uh, just to sort of summarize the, the potential danger, the actual dangers here, can you both remind us, with, beginning with you, Charles, why it's not a good idea to berate your top health experts when you got a pandemic ravaging the country? Well, scientific expertise, epidemiological expertise is central to getting through the pandemic. And as we've seen in Europe, in China, other countries, where that expertise has been used to guide public policy, there has been dramatic improvement. And I would include places in the United States, such as New York City, where dramatic improvement has been attained by using that sort of guidance as a way of navigating this terrible time. The rejection of that is leading to the kind of disaster that we're seeing throughout the country. Well, um, I think on the one hand, it leads us to question the credibility, not of those public health experts, but of the president himself. Secondly, as Charles has articulated um, very well, we need that science in order to control the outbreak, just as a practical matter. Every country that has controlled the outbreak has relied on science. And with, even within the US, um, we've seen success based on whether the science was being followed or not. I think I would be remiss if I didn't say that like many scientists, journalists who are trying to convey this information accurately and completely are also under attack not just by President Trump, but also by many of his allies who have been targeting journalists as part of the problem. And what I think we found over and over again is that concerns among many in the public about what seem to many of us like common sense and very good advice, wear a mask, do social distancing. I think there's obvious confusion, understandable confusion, because of the, the different news sources that communicate these issues in a very, very different way. And second, there's also the basic fact that, that science and journalism are in the business of rewriting themselves day by day in gaining insights and correcting the record and advancing knowledge day by day in a way that 
many people might find confusing. This idea of changing your story a little bit when new information comes out, sometimes that's derided as a, a kind of failing. But actually, it's what makes journalism and science effective in communicating a message. Yeah. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is that the attack is not on people. It's really an attack on the science. It's an attack on the public health. It is an attack on the public health. Charles Pillard, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thanks, Seth. Allison Galvani, thank you for being with us as well. Thank you. Allison Galvani is the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Modeling and Analysis at the Yale School of Public Health and professor of epidemiology. Charles Pillar is an investigative reporter for the journal Science. Well, who needs a PhD or an MD to inform your science pronouncements when you can have a well-honed personal gut feeling? How did we get to this point where people who don't have any background in a subject hold their hand up and say, let me explain the subject to you, to the expert? Is it that we question the experts or that we think our own know-how is sufficient? What's driving all of this next? It's Skeptic Check Know-It-Alls on Big Picture Science. So here we are in the middle of a pandemic, and science and scientists are being frequently ignored when their input is literally a matter of life and death. So whom are we listening to instead? Perhaps this is part of a larger, peculiar American trend, because it isn't just epidemiologists and other medical types who are being challenged, as Tom Nichols discovered. Well, first you have to understand my background, which is that I am a longtime expert in Russian affairs over 30 years. I speak Russian. I've been to Russia many times. I've written several books about Russia. And he was having a conversation with a man who didn't have a background in Russian affairs. And this person said to me, Tom, I don't think you really understand Russia. Let me explain Russia to you. That's when I said, you know, it's one thing to say, I'd like more information, or I'd like to hear more from you about this, or I don't quite trust your view and I want to explore that, it was the idea that this person was going, who had, had no background in the subject whatsoever, said, I'm going to explain Russia to you. That's when I decided that maybe it was time to start writing about this, that something terrible had gone wrong in our society. It prompted him to write an article, The Death of Expertise for the Federalist, a conservative online magazine. Now, you could say he took the encounter with a non-Russian expert personally, fair enough. But then Dr. Nichols' article was so widely shared, he soon had an outpouring of anecdotes from other professionals. It happens in every walk of life, not just professions, but the trades. I've heard similar stories from plumbers, electricians, painters, people that have a lot of experience and a lot of expertise in, you know, building a house and someone walks up to them and says, hey, let me explain to you about what kind of wood you're using there. I have some views on this because I read a magazine article once and it has really gotten out of control. I mean, it is a, we are in a society where we lecture each other all day long about things that we don't know anything about. And his remedy in the moment when it happens may not be yours, but here's one expert's opinion on what to do if expertise is questioned. I've been telling experts, if someone says, you know, Seth, you're, you're an astrophysicist kind of guy, you know, people say, well, you know, how do I know the earth isn't flat? We're trained as teachers to say, that's very interesting. Let's unpack that together. Okay, I understand your point. You know, and I think that people ought to just say, just stop. The earth isn't flat. We're not starting from zero here. We weren't all just born yesterday. The earth is round. If you don't accept that, then we can't have this conversation. <laughs> well, all right. I like his muscular reply there. I, I'm, I'm going to use that sometime. He expanded his ideas into a book, The Death of Expertise, the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters. It explores our stubbornness, or maybe it's arrogance, to admit 
we might be ignorant about a subject and, and should defer to someone else. I asked Dr. Nichols whether the long-standing American distrust of expertise is perhaps enjoying a bit of a resurgence. And he surprised me by saying, that, well, that's not exactly what's happening. Okay, I'll admit my ignorance on this. It's not so much that we question authority, Dr. Nichols says, but that we're comfortable reading up on a topic for a few minutes and then anointing ourselves as experts. Well, I knew that the public was um, going through this long period that I think began about 40 years ago of a narcissistic rejection of expertise. I think that these two things go hand in hand. But I had always been confident that in the face of a genuine national emergency, that people would kind of snap out of this lethargy and say, all right, well, we actually have to do what the experts, you know, recommend that we do. And I just didn't imagine that expertise would become this kind of crazy partisan uh, food fight that it's turned into. And you could argue that not trusting the experts, being a little bit skeptical about their from on high uh, pronouncements might actually have an upside. Except that's not what's happening. And I've said many times, skepticism of experts is the right to approach expertise in a democracy, especially where we have to rely on expert advice to our elected representatives. This isn't skepticism. This is people thinking that they actually know more than epidemiologists. And it's perfectly legitimate to say, what kind of assumptions are we working from here? What sort of things you know, went into you constructing this model? It's another thing entirely to say to somebody like Dr. Fauci, you know, to an epidemiologist, uh, let me explain to you how epidemics work. But is this, I mean, in a, in a larger sense, is this really a rebellion against expertise or is simply a split along party lines that this is, this is politics, this is an, an indictment of expertise? Um, no, it is a rebellion of expertise, and it's been going for a good 30 or 40 years. This is really the final stage of a growing narcissism not just the American public, but the public's in technologically advanced Western societies, where the public has come to believe that most things in life are easy to do. Um, how hard can it be to send an email? You just write it and you hit send. How hard can it be to you know, fly an airplane? Um, you know, they, I mean, literally people who have made the argument that because I know Microsoft Fright Simulator, I can fly an airplane. You know, how hard can it be to diagnose a disease? And I think that that long predates this current emergency. So this is, this is not just some partisan blow up. This is the partisan division we're having over the COVID epidemic now is it's a um, symptom of the problem, not, not a cause. You make the case that the backlash against expertise has been aided by the government and the media. Maybe you could explain that to me. I think part of the problem with the media is not that the media in any one area has made a mistake, although I think the particular role of conservative media during the pandemic has been really shameful. Um, but I think the problem is that there's just so much media. Audiences are always surprised when I tell them that the evening news, and, and Seth, you and I are old enough to remember this, the evening news used to be 28 minutes. To say that you watched the news meant that you actually paid attention for 20 minutes or 25 minutes. Now, there are so many news outlets, and it is indistinguishable during most of those hours from entertainment, that people are taking in a lot more news, but they're actually a lot less informed than they used to be. The generation of people in the 60s and 70s who watched a half hour of news were actually much better informed than people are today because they actually paid attention to those um, news broadcasts. Well, what about the influence of the fact that the news back then was curated? It was, it was, you know, read to you by a professional reader, perhaps, but that reader was often a journalist, and the journalism was curated. I mean, it wasn't what you find on the Internet. I mean, it's maybe too easy to blame the Internet for uh, the lack of respect for, if you will, expertise, but surely it plays a big role today. You know, younger listeners will probably recoil at that word curated because when they hear it, they think of gatekeepers. They think of old white guys like us publishing other old white guys like us. I mean, you go back to the 1960s and 70s and the news was three old guys in New York reading corporate curated news, you know, created and written by other old white guys. So there, there's a legitimate um, complaint about that. And I think we live in a better world where the news has 
uh, where there's greater diversity in the people who make and report the news. But with that said, I am completely with you about this problem of curation. Um, younger people in particular don't understand that information does not exist independently of the people who create it. Um, this is particularly true when it comes to the internet. As students will often say to me, they say, well, you know, professor, the internet's just a big library. And I'm like, no, libraries have librarians. You know, the internet is a dumpster. Uh, sometimes dumpster diving, you can find a filet mignon, but mostly what you find is garbage. I'll, I'll just finish by saying, I always tell my writing students, I had a blog for some years and I took it down because I have come to realize that I was part of the problem. No one should work without an editor. No one. I don't care how, Tiger Woods has a swing coach and even the best writers need an editor. And I think we need to get back to that. Tom, I'd like to step back a little bit, uh, give this a slightly more international perspective. I lived in Europe for, uh, for quite a while, 13 years, and I was uh, certainly aware that Europeans treated members of academe a little differently than they are treated in the United States. My junk mail had all sorts of titularization in front of my name. So I think it's maybe a generalization, but a fair one, that America's attitude to the learned has always been somewhat less than reverential. Is that because of our greater distrust of authority, our pioneer past? Yeah, I think some of it comes from our um, kind of hyper egalitarian culture that you can go all the way back to Tocqueville. We're not a country that likes, you know, as you say, all these titular kind of doctor, professor. Um, you know, I always get a kick out of it when I fly foreign airlines and they'll send me, you know, email to professor, doctor, mister, you know, and I, I actually like that about America. America is where, you know, anybody can grow up and get a PhD and, you know, become an expert on something. Um, but I do think that some of the rejection of expertise is a kind of generalized resentment, um, a kind of reverse snobbery that people who have advanced degrees are inherently bad people. And we know this because they have advanced degrees. I think that that's one thing that's definitely changed over the years. And then when I've written about it, I think some of it is the inherent devaluing of education that happens when everybody goes to college. Because, you know, when you have universal, almost, I mean, compared to where we were 50 years ago, widespread college attendance, you know, there's a lot of variation in those college experiences. And people say, well, I went to college and I have a college degree and my professors were idiots. Well, it's, it's possible that they were. It's possible that that happened. But um, generalized resentment. And again, I think this falls into a partisan slot now, in part because academia has become, um, I think, both more integrated into politics, but less useful in that sense. I mean, it, there used to be a time when scholars went back and forth to government. Now scholars mostly comment on government. And I think that that is probably an unhealthy trend. I recall when elite was actually a good adjective. I mean, you know, right? E elite universities, maybe that's still good. But any other time you say, well, you're being elitist, that's not a compliment. One of the things that I think has become very unfortunate is that people have conflated the words expert and elite. You know, I, I was an advisor to a U.S. senator in my misspent youth, and I worked on Capitol Hill. And when people would say, you elites, and I'd say, wait, he was the senior senator from Pennsylvania and a billionaire. And he was the one that got a vote and had a desk on the Senate floor. He was the elite. I was the expert. You know, there's a difference. Um, but if, if you look at me and a wealthy U.S. senator and say you are both alike, that tells you something about the current state of, you know, the way people think about politics in the United States. What about the fact that many people do not really understand how science works, that if a scientist gets something wrong, then suddenly I don't have to listen to you anymore, scientist, because you got something wrong. We gotcha. This, is, this has caused a really unpleasant dynamic between experts and the public. The public wants to play gotcha. Aha, you were wrong about eggs, right? You doctors were wrong about eggs. Therefore, I never have to listen to my doctor again, and I can eat cheeseburgers for breakfast because my doctor's an idiot because he got eggs wrong. And experts 
I think, become very reluctant to own their mistakes because they, they think if they admit an error, the public's never going to let them forget it and let them off the hook. And I, I can understand that. Finally, Tom, let me, let me ask you, let's, let's look to the future here. Ever since World War II, there's been this narrative in this country that science will inevitably lead humanity to a better future. We look condescendingly on the Dark Ages as being benighted. Do you think that the arc of history is inevitably bent toward trust and expertise? Will we get out of this problem? I don't know. I think that technology and progress will continue to march on whether we like it or respect it or not. Um, you know, I'm constantly amazed that people don't recognize what expertise has already brought them. Um, one of the people who took issue with my point early on when I was writing about this said, what have experts really done for us in the past 50 years? I mean, even if you leave aside science, right, science will always march on. But I mean, if you want to make it to my own field of expertise in politics and diplomacy, we have not had a major global war in 75 years. That's not an accident. You know, thousands and thousands of people over the course of multiple generations made that a reality. And I think we've just kind of gotten used to that, that, well, of course, you know, the world is connected and at peace and there isn't any big interstate war. And nobody's used nuclear weapons against each other as if that were all like the gentle, you know, the rain that droppeth from heaven. Um, but, you know, experts made all that happen. They created the Bretton Woods arrangement. They created NATO. They created the United Nations. And uh, I think people would have just gotten so used to that that they don't even notice it anymore. And I think that'll probably continue. And maybe that's part of the privilege of living in an advanced democracy. Tom Nichols, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Good to be with you, Seth. Tom Nichols is Professor of International Affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. He is an expert in Russian affairs, and he is the author of The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge, and Why It Matters. Next, how would one of your ancestors have picked out the wisest person in the community? Based on experience, you say? Not on, say, the number of social media followers? Nothing about prehistoric society had anything to do with how recent the knowledge was. In fact, the older it is, probably the more adaptive it was, or the popularity. How our vetting process for expertise has radically changed. Next, it's skeptic check know-it-alls on Big Picture Science. It wasn't always like this. There was a time when we agreed who the experts were, and we listened to them. I mean, in the Second World War, and for about a decade or so afterwards, science expertise was revered. But now, well, never mind the PhDs, the MDs, the sheepskin on the wall, the years devoted to field work or spent in hospital residencies. The metric for whether I'll listen to your counsel is exactly how many followers do you have on social media? We have explicit popularity statistics associated with almost everything we do. How many Twitter followers? How many retweets of, of this tweet? How many downloads of this song? Everything you look at, almost the principal datum point that you look at is its popularity, not how good it is, and you have no idea whether that person sharing is an expert or not. Alex Bentley is an anthropologist, and since he is my brother, I can vouch for his expertise in cultural evolution, first as the head of archaeology and anthropology at the University of Bristol in the UK, and now at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Tennessee. He writes about how websites, social media, and algorithms have devastated curated information sources and replaced them with expertise that we rate not on the basis of their accuracy, but on the basis of our clicks. In his book, the acceleration of cultural change from ancestors to algorithms, Dr. Bentley compares how we used to identify our experts way back when to how we do so now and how our obsession with novelty 
has helped undermine our appreciation of real know-how. Okay, he starts with our ancestors, so our first question is a broad one. How did our ancestors make decisions? It's also a loaded question because um, in, in some ways we didn't make decisions. The culture made decisions for us on an intergenerational time basis. So let's say we're talking about 7,000 years ago in a Neolithic village somewhere. Most of what, what you did, what people in your kinship group did, were all learned from the previous generation and with almost no difference from uh, the previous generation. But the decisions, if we want to call them that, those are the changes in the learned practices and habits that would happen over many generations. Let's give an example, if you could give an example, of something that would have been passed down and that would have stayed more or less intact for millennia. Yeah. What's an example? Uh, well, there's just about everything um, from prehistory. So um, I'm an archaeologist, and um, one of the best examples most archaeologists know about is the, uh, it's called the Acheulean hand axe. And it was actually used by Homo um, erectus. It would have been chipped out of flint or chert, and it's about the size of your hand, and you could use it for digging or uh, scraping a hide or all sorts of things. And some uh, Homo erectus would have carried it next to the body probably for much of the day, um, and it persists. The oldest one is about 1.4 1, 1. million years ago, and it persists to um, a few hundred thousand years ago. Uh, almost unchanged. It was like a Swiss army knife of, um, of ancient hominins. And one of the things that I wanted to get across in the book is that the notion of change in technology or change in culture is something that's entirely modern. It just would have been uh, totally alien to people in, the, in prehistory. I want to ask you about the title of your book, The Acceleration of Cultural Change. And, and what does that mean to you, that the pace of cultural change has picked up, and, and what do you mean by accelerate? Um, it's accelerated. So if you look at, say, the, imagine a graph of how many um, different tool types people had a million years ago to um, literally hundreds of thousands of choices in a single Walmart. And that curve would be flat just about for the first point ninety nine percent of our our evolution and then suddenly it just looks like it just stands on end and just heads straight up like a rocket but the other aspect of the the, the meaning of acceleration is that we went from a um, a vertical kind of transmission where we learn from ancestors our parents but whose knowledge that stretches back through the generations to ancestors who were it's a deep knowledge because it goes back so far in time, and it's also a fairly narrow knowledge because it's restricted to our local community, local environment. And now we have a very, a kind of a very shallow yesterday's news kind of knowledge that is also global and not restricted to any particular environment. And nowadays, every so much is learned horizontally. Another what's, what's an example of that? Any story that you shared on social media today that's horizontal. And you're not teaching it to your child over a period of 12 years while that child grows up. So um, in, in our field, we friends of mine do experiments called transmission chains. They're, they're like a game of telephone where you have somebody uh, read a passage like a um, maybe it's a story of cats and Oreo cookies and, and how they, they, they took to the Oreo cookies like cocaine. I would, might be, I would love to hear this story about cats might be, and Oreo cookies, but go on. <laughs> that, that was like a, uh, so that's like a news story from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Okay. And then, so I read that and then I put it down and then I remember what I can from that story. And you probably already remember the Oreos and the cocaine and you'll write something. The cats ate the Oreos. It, it tasted like cocaine to them. But just now I introduced a couple of changes to it. A couple of those elements stay with the story as I pass it on. And it'll probably, if we pass it around, a chain of eight, 16 people. Uh, the other end, it might the story might have taken on a totally different plot, but I'll bet you the Oreos and the word cocaine would still be there in cats. Those, we call those attractors. When we, when we share information online, you don't do any of that. You don't, you don't, when you retweet something, you don't read it, memorize it, and then write it again. So as everyone knows, we, we don't separate any wheat from any chaff anymore. We just pass it on. We've been comparing the traditions of our ancestors, and some of the examples you gave had to do with maybe building a hand axe that really didn't change much over tens of thousands of years, and then comparing it with whatever it is that we are trading in on social media. Is that comparing apples and or oranges? Because on one hand, we're talking about 
physical objects, and we still need those today. We still need physical tools. And the other is almost storytelling. And have we mixed two groups that should really remain? Nope. It, in evolutionary separate. terms, um, that's what makes evolution so useful, uh, the theory, because each one of those is a case of replication of a um, essentially a, a code. So hominids didn't actually pass down the hand axe from generation to gen- generation. They made them. They passed down the knowledge, the, the algorithm. It, was, it's, it could be called an algorithm. There's a, there's a certain, they call it chaîne opératoire in hand axe studies. Um, what is the recipe for making these? In what order do you, do you chip the stone, turn over the, the piece of chert, where do you chip it, and so on? There's a, there's a set kind of algorithm to making it. But when anthropologists study how knowledge is transferred in traditional societies, let's say um, yam cultivators on the islands of Fiji, so a lot of food is um, you know uh, yams, sweet potatoes that are cultivated, or fish, or um, other kinds of harvesting. And there's also, in a village, also somebody who knows a lot about traditional medicines. Let's just take those three examples. You ask anyone in the village, they'll know who the best uh, hunter is. And they'll all point to probably the same person, the same two people. They'll all know who the best yam cultivator is, or the, and that'll be somebody different. They'll all know who the best fisher person is, and they'll all know who knows everything about, about traditional medicine and, and the medicinal values of plants. And those, those networks all point straight away to the expert in the community. And now we explicitly, we, we have explicit popularity statistics associated with almost everything we do. How many Twitter followers? How many retweets of this of this tweet? How many downloads of this song? Everything you look at, almost the principal datum point that you look at is its popularity, not how good it is, and you have no idea whether that person sharing is an expert or not. And this um, is the algorithm part of your book. Yeah. So from ancestors, we talked about the ancestors, but yeah. now you're talking about how the algorithms are driving the popularity. Is that yeah. Is that right? And so I know that, uh, you know, social media algorithms are evolving quickly, but they're still basically premised on on prioritizing recency and popularity. And nothing I've just said about prehistoric society had anything to do with how recent the knowledge was. In fact, the older it is, probably the more adaptive it was, or the popularity. It had to do with um, the expertise of this person that was teaching you, and that probably if it was a skill like, like building a bow and arrow, it would have taken maybe many years to learn that skill. Or, so, or it, wasn't, it was neither popular nor recent. And now those are the two things that we primarily direct our attention to. Who's doing the deciding at this point? You said that there, was a, there were no deciders in our ancestral life. There was kind of a group consensus born out over the usefulness of the knowledge, its adaptive value. Is that the same case now? I, I get the sense that the adaptive value is not so relevant right now, but there's some machine, or at least somebody is deciding for us what we even call culture now. Yeah, that's a good question. Some some people see, you know, almost like, they almost see individuals at the center of this process, like the CEOs of social media companies and so on. And I do have some computer scientist colleagues who worry about that. But I actually think the decider is just evolution. It's a different evolutionary process now, one that where the biases of evolution are now towards what is recent, what is popular. And that encourages a, a kind of evolutionary process that's always been there, but has never been so strong, which is called random drift. So what we, what we see and what you'll be conscious of is that what we're all focusing on our attention on in a certain day just seems to feel random. That's, that's random drift. That's a process that will inevitably bring something to the surface. Something will win. Something will become like the mega subject that we're all, that gets 100,000 views today. But there's, there's not necessarily any utility to it. But isn't that a problem for a species? It sounds like that's maladaptive. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I don't want to get too speculative right now, but people are doing um, some maladaptive things like not getting immunized, for example. Um, and that's a case of misinformation coming to the surface and um, people believing it because it's popular and because others around them believe it. Um, and President Obama, in his, in his uh, farewell address in 2017, picked up on um, what many people have picked up on, that, that we are siloing ourselves and um, just echoing the opinions of those around us. That's an evolutionary process. There's no, there's no sort of mastermind to that process. 
so we share things, and I think th- there are small, maybe there's small little um, endorphin bursts when you share something and somebody likes it. Th- that's an evolved capacity that used to do us good, but is is now being co-opted by technologies that, that then cause our knowledge and our cultural information to drift in a kind of a random genetic way. Imagine, imagine how, how disastrous it would be if when you go to vote. The next time you go to vote, you could see how all the different candidates were trending at that moment instead of just voting for the person that you wanted to vote for. I hate to break this to you, uh, but that is happens. actually what's happening oh, well, now. Well, I don't get out much. So. <laughs> um, but um, that process corrupts our ability to track quality. And it was a, there was an experiment uh, 15 years ago by Matt Salganic and Duncan Watts where they had uh, people download music. And when they downloaded music from, uh, let's say, a set of 50 songs and they did it on their own and they listened to the songs and they, they would generally sort of all agree on the top, top five. And those would come to the top. They'd run the experiment with a gr- another new group of students and still the same top five. As soon as they let people observe what others were downloading, the whole thing just became unpredictable. Um, and you'd get a different winner in each run of the experiment and with no correlation to what, what you would probably think the actual quality of the songs are given people thinking individually. And this is what the whole wisdom of crowds premise is predicated on people thinking ind- individually about the, about the problem or the challenge and not listening to or, or being influenced by others. As soon as you do that, you lose the wisdom of crowds. Why is that? Why are we driven by popularity? Why is it that I might choose what I think my favorite song is or my favorite candidate or whatever it might be, and then I'm influenced by the choice of my neighbor? If, if I've made a decision based on my, my interests, why would I care what my neighbor has picked out? Because the success of our species is based on cooperation, all the way back to sharing food on the savanna. Uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years ago. And um, it's shown time and time again that um, that cooperative groups can outcompete groups in traditional or prehistoric settings would have outcompeted groups that were unable to cooperate so effectively. Well, another difference, though, um, Alex, is that we've outsourced our memory. So in the examples you gave, um, the algorithms were produced by the human mind and they were retained and they were acted upon in the human mind. And certainly very or, few people could recite um, a poem that was as long as the Bible. Or collections of minds. So for example, there are some cases that are debated in anthropology of like extreme population uh, reduction over like a generation from thousands to maybe hundreds. And you see knowledge, cumulative knowledge get lost. We store our knowledge in our respective experts in the community. It's never in one brain. Mm-hmm. Um, so where you're going with that is we now outsource, um, but we don't, we don't outsource them to people, so we don't know where they are. I have colleagues who are expert in, in putrefaction, which is a forensic anthropology. So I know where to go to. Those are like my, you know, those are like my storage banks. Um, How often do you have to consult with an expert yeah. in putrefaction? Um, often, in my case, but um, but I also know that they are experts because of not not just because other people say so, but because I probably have day to day experience and you know pretty much certainty that these people are experts. But if I Google something and I get a sale on rubber tile, I don't know anything about the expertise of of that information. And and if something is put into my social media feed. I don't know where it came from, and I don't have that daily experience or, or certainly not the intergenerational experience, shall we call it, of my culture to vet that for me and tell me that it's expertise. Alex Bentley, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Alex Bentley is an anthropologist at the University of Tennessee and the author of The Acceleration of Cultural Change from Ancestors to Algorithms. So the big picture here in this program about expertise is multifaceted. We heard a number of opinions about what's happening now and what may happen in the future in terms of who we go to for expert advice. I mean, the immediate question we're addressing is why is the federal government distancing itself from expertise during a pandemic? And clearly the answer is a very immediate one. Politics, bad news, is perceived to be bad news. But the leitmotif we've heard from all the guests in this show is that regard for expertise seems to be in decline in general. You know, one of the consequences of the easy access 
to information that we all have now in our pockets, if you will, our cell phones, is that everybody now thinks they're an expert. One of the things we're hearing is that it's important to be able to admit when you're ignorant of something and to look at ideas for their quality and the expertise behind them, not just their popularity. Well, thank you to the expertise of senior producer Gary Niederhoff and assistant producer Sarah Derwin. We do not take their skill for granted. I am executive producer of Big Picture Science, Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization that supports critical thinking in matters of science. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak. Also, a big thanks to our listeners. This episode of Big Picture Science, one of our regular looks at critical thinking, is called Skeptic Check Know-It-Alls. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to the guests you've heard. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.